This conference is being recorded Wednesday, May 11, 2016. I would now like to turn the conference over to Katie Dane, Director of the NCD Alliance. Please go ahead. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everybody. Welcome to this NCD Alliance webinar on the 11th of May. We've got a, an absolutely packed um, agenda for you today. Um, we're going to be starting off by giving you an overview of the upcoming World Health Assembly, which is happening in a couple of weeks in Geneva. Um, that's going to be presented to you by Elena Matska from in Geneva. Secondly, we have a few guest speakers um, on the line today. Um, we're going to start off with an overview of the WHO Global Coordination Mechanism by Dr. Benton Nicholson, who's the head of the Global Coordination Mechanism at WHO. And then that presentation will be followed by two presentations on the new GCM um, Working Group report that has been published just a couple of weeks ago. One of them is on financing for NCDs, which will be presented to you by Dr. Rachel Nugent from RTI International. And secondly, we've got Sir Trevor Hassel presenting the GCM Working Group report on engagement with the private sector. This will be followed by a presentation by Dr. Francesca Branco from um, the World Health Organization to talk you through the nutrition-specific agenda items at the World Health Assembly. And then finally, we will wrap up with an overview of New York um, activities, particularly looking at the follow-up and review process of the 2030 agenda and the financing for development follow-up, which will be by um, Priya Kniesen from the NCD Alliance in New York. So as you can see, we have a, a lot to cover and lots of fantastic speakers joining us today. So with no further ado, I will pass straight over to Elena Matska to talk you through the, the World Health Assembly agenda items. Elena. Hi, everybody. A warm welcome. I'm also from me here in Geneva. I will move straight into the hot topics um, that we can expect um, to be discussed at this year's World Health Assembly. It's the 69th um, World Health Assembly. Um, surely we will hear a great deal um, about uh, the WHO reform. Um, it's been a couple of years that the organization is, is reforming and hopefully we'll see the adoption of WHO's framework for engagement with non-state actors at this year's WHA. Surely um, antimicrobial resistance and the upcoming high-level meeting this fall will be um, an important topic as well as, well as WHO's um, reform of, of the organization's emergency management, um, women's, children's, and adolescents' health will be high on the agenda, and so will be childhood obesity, as well as um, Jamie Oliver's attendance um, as the new nutrition champion um, at the WHA. M uh, moving on to the next slide. Just a very, very quick um, overview of NCD-related agenda item as mentioned. Um, WHO's framework for engagement with non-state actors, or, sh or short FENSA, um, will be an important topic. Under the NCD's agenda item, we find nutrition, um, several nutrition items. We find a draft global plan of action on violence. Then the proper NCD's um, agenda item on, on preparations for the 2018 high-level review, um, as well as strengthening synergies between the WHA and the um, con conference of the parties of the FCTC. Then um, also an agenda item on the UNGAS that took place just last month in um, New York on the world drug problem. Next slide, please. Um, and then um, under the agenda item, promoting health across the life course, several NCD-related agenda items, including a uh, an agenda item on the 2030 agenda on the global strategy in women's, children's, and adolescents' health, um, the draft global plan of, uh, of action on aging and health, the draft roadmap on air pollution, as well as an agenda item on the sound management of chemicals. Finally, um, two other um, items that may be of interest, one on um, the health of migrants, and then also addressing the global shortages of medicine here specifically related to children's medication. Next slide, please. Um, just to, to orient you with regards to the daily schedule at this year's WJ, the daily timetable has just been, been scheduled, so allow me to just 
very briefly walk you through what's going to happen on a day-by-day -day basis. As always, this is subject to change, so it will be important that you check the WJ journal each day for an update on the agenda. So on the first day, the Monday, 23rd of May, the assembly will open. Um, Dr. Margaret Chen will address the assembly, and so will be an invite invited speaker, high-level speaker, um, yet um, not, um, not known to me. Um, and the assembly will then open um, with the WHO reform in order to set up a, a drafting group on, on FENSA. On Tuesday, um, the assembly will continue on WHO reform, then moving on to promoting health through the life course, including the 2030 agenda and related items on Wednesday. Um, WHA will move on to preparedness, surveillance, and response. And on Thursday, then move back, continuing on this agenda item as well as um, with any, any uncovered, unfinished business on promoting health through the life course. And then finally, um, hopefully starting on NCDs on Thursday, this um, may be pushed over to Friday, so stay tuned for that. And then on Saturday, the assembly is expected to finalize any outstanding reports and resolutions and close on the same day. I've included here a link um, to the WJ journal with the daily timetable and also a link to all of the WHO document, the WJ documents that um, have, made, have been made available to date. Next slide, please. All right, starting us off on um, prevention and control of NCDs. The report is not available yet, but will most likely look very similar to the report that went to the Executive Board in January. Um, so a report with several annexes covering um, progress on the implementation of the Global Action Plan, as well as the achievement of the nine global targets. Um, it will also cover the update of the Appendix 3 of the Global NCD Action Plan, um, as well as um, an a proposed approach to register contributions by non-state actors in the NCD response. It will cover the development um, of a purpose code to track, to track overseas development assistance, uh, official development assistance for NCDs, um, and then also cover an outline of the UN Secretary General report um, that will be published in 2017 in preparation for the UN High Level Review in 2018 in New York. Um, we, uh, the WHA is expected to adopt a, a resolution which urges acceleration of implementation of national commitments, including um, in particular the strengthening of surveillance systems in the lead up to the 2018 UN High Level Review, and this resolution will also endorse um, the processes to update Appendix 3 of the Global Entity Action Plan. Um, we're expecting consultations with civil society this summer. Um, no date for this has been confirmed yet, though. Um, and then also endorsing the process um, to develop an approach to register and publish contributions of non-state actors. Um, and both of these um, will be expected to, to be submitted to the WHA in 2017. Next slide, please. Our main advocacy messaging um, around messages around NCDs um, is that we will be encouraging member states to um, include a note in the WHA NCD resolution um, on the reports of the WHO GCM NCD working groups um, on financing for NCDs and engagement of the private sector to encourage implementation of the, the recommendations at the national level. Um, and member states' um, discussions at WHA should also recognize um, the concerning lack of progress against the nine global targets and highlight um, that the preparations for the 2018 UN high-level meeting really start now, requiring member states to fast-track implementation of, five, of, the four, five, of the four time bound commitments of the 2014 UN review outcome document, um, requiring the prioritization of strengthening of monitoring and surveillance system. Um, 
and also um, support of the technical work underway by WHO to develop an MC purpose code in the OECD's predatory reporting system. Finally, um, we will also highlight um, that preparations for the UN high level meeting must include comprehensive consulta a comprehensive consultation process, including at the regional level and with civil society. Next slide, please. Um, as I said before, there will be three um, different nutrition items discussed at the WOJ. Francesco Branca will later go um, into more detail um, on these, so that we'll be glossing over um, this slide. Um, so the three uh, nutrition-related agenda items are a new WHO guidance on ending the inappropriate promotion of foods for infants and young children. And here we really strongly urge member states to support um, a draft resolution that will um, endorse the proposed guidance and recommend reporting every two years on implementation. Um, the second agenda item will be around um, a recently proclaimed Decade for Action on Nutrition 2016-2015 by the UN General Assembly in New York. Um, and finally, um, also very important from Steve's perspective, is the report of the Commission on Ending Childhood Obesity. And here um, we urge the member states to adopt a resolution to develop a comprehensive implementation plan to ensure full implementation of the comprehensive integrated package of policy actions recommended by the Commission, um, including a robust monitoring and accountability framework and involve civil society closely in the development of this plan. Next slide, please. Moving on to health in the 2030 agenda, the WH, um, as a, the report that has been published on the WJ website um, links achievement of all health-related goals in the SDGs to the underlying ambition to realizing UHC, universal health coverage. It emphasizes that population, it emphasizes um, that population aging and antimicrobial resistance must be addressed. Importantly, it urges governments to capitalize on existing synergies to promote policy coherence and engage non-health sectors such as finance, trade, agriculture, etc. Um, it stresses that um, development assistance for health and ODA must continue, um, however, accompanied by increased domestic resource mobilization, including through taxation of unhealthy products. Um, there's definitely an acknowledgement of challenges regarding the availability of data and um, also very important, um, the report notes the role of civil society in follow-up and review and promoting accountability. Um, the action to be taken by the um, WHA um, consists in, in the adoption, in fact, of two um, resolutions, one specifically on universal health coverage, um, as well as a, a second resolution on the role of WHO in the implementation of the 2030 agenda. Next slide, please. Um, agenda, an agenda item of great interest for many of the WHA will be the WHO's operational plan to take forward the global strategy on women's, children's, and adolescents' health. Um, the operational plan recommends um, to governments um, to use the targets in the global strategy to update existing national policies, strategies, and budgets, to develop a sustainable health financing strategy, to strengthen health systems, and to harness the power of partnerships as well as to enhance accountability mechanism. And all of this um, is underpinned by cross-cutting efforts to achieve UHC. Kenya and Uruguay um, will be putting forward a resolution by which WHO member states will commit to implement the new global strategy and to report every other year on progress to WHA. And it goes without saying that we strongly support um, this resolution. Next slide, please. Health and the environment um, is becoming an increasingly important topic at the World Health Assembly. Um, the Assembly will be asked to endorse a roadmap on air pollution 2016-2019. This roadmap is intended to enable the health sector to take a leading role in raising awareness of 
impact and sustainable solutions to air pollution across sectors. Um, we're still awaiting a report presenting the investment case and scale of investment needed to implement the activities in the proposed roadmap, including WHO's technical support to countries. So stay tuned for that. Um, and if you're interested in the topics of entities and climate change, I've included here for you a link to um, our new policy brief on entities and climate change emphasizing co-benefit solutions. Um, the safe management of chemicals um, has not been a central component of, of our work or the NCD response in general um, to date. However, there's a growing body of evidence that suggests exposure to harmful chemicals leads to increased likelihood of developing NCDs, including but not limited to cancer and mental and neurological disorders, and therefore we will be closely following this agenda item at the WHA and also encourage particular emphasis of NCDs in a roadmap that is being proposed to be developed for adoption by the WHA in 2017. Next slide, please. All right, moving on to WHO FENSA. Um, this has been a central element of WHO's governance reform and has been hampering um, efforts to address NCDs in, in WHO's work. Um, it consists of, overarch of an overarching framework and separate policies for NGOs, for academia, for philanthropic foundations, as well as the private sector. An intergovernmental meeting in April was able to finalize the majority of the text, um, but there still remains some work on several paragraphs related to the private sector policy. Um, however, the larger, the bigger question really is around implementation, um, and, and this could then involve a consideration of, of, a ver of a number of paragraphs that so far have been agreed at referendum. Um, in order to finalize these outstanding issues, FENSA will be taken up on the first day of WHA on Monday the 23rd so that a drafting group can be established, which will then hopefully be able to finalize the text and um, an, accompanying, an accompanying resolution for adoption of the framework at this year's WHA. From our perspective, we would very much welcome the adoption of the framework at this year's WHA with um, an evaluation of its implementation in 2018. And we welcome um, provisions for secondments from NGOs and academia. And we also strongly urge member states, states to retain paragraph 44 bis and a footnote paragraph 33 in the private sector policies, pointing um, or recognizing the adverse impact of some industries' products and practices on health incomes in particular, uh, sorry, on health outcomes in particular um, on NCDs. Next slide, please. Other relevant items, and um, I apologize already for only being able to gloss over these. As Katie said, we have a very packed agenda in this, this webinar. Um, the first item on this list is um, strengthening the synergies between the World Health Assembly and the Conference of the Parties of the FCTC. Um, there's a, a resolution that uh, member states will be asked to adopt, um, which consists in, consist in a decision to include outcomes of the FCTC COP on the WHA agenda and vice versa. The second um, item on this list is the draft global strategy and plan of action on aging and health. This plan of action runs from 2016 to 2020 and has two goals. One is to achieve five years of evidence-based action to maximize functional ability that reaches every person, and the second to, by 2020, establish evidence and partnerships necessary to support a decade of, action, of healthy aging, a decade of healthy aging from 2020 to 2030. Um, finally, um, as mentioned earlier, um, another item to watch is 60.4, addressing the global shortages of medicine and safety and 
accessibility of children's medication. This was followed in greater detail by our colleagues at the World Heart Federation and the Union for International Cancer Control. If you're interested in this, this um, agenda item, I suggest you, you reach out to um, WHF and UICC colleagues. The Assembly is expected to note a report as well as to adopt a draft resolution on this item. Next slide, please. There will be several technical briefings that will all take place in room 12 um, at lunchtime on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday and Friday of, of the week. The two that are most likely of, of, um, of most importance to you will be the one on Tuesday on health on the 2030 agenda, and then on Wednesday will be a technical briefing on the global strategy for women, children, and adolescents. Health. Next slide, please. There's two main side events that the MC Lions is involved in. Um, the first one um, is on the. It will highlight the importance of making the case for NCDs and discussing smarter approaches and means of implementation required to deliver health outcomes in the SDG era. Um, we have a great set of speakers confirmed, including the regional director of WHO Af of the WHO Africa region, the Secretary of Health of the Department of Health, the Republic of the Philippines, um, Dr. Rachel Nugent, who will be presenting on this webinar um, later on, and then also the Executive Vice President of External Affairs of Sanofi. Um, we're equally delighted to be among the co-organizers of an event on accelerating progress on tackling both child obesity and undernutrition. This event will be hosted by the government of Finland um, and is supported by a variety of member states, the UN Standing Committee on Nutrition, the Global Nutrition Report, as well as a coalition of over 12 civil society organizations. The speakers at this event will include the Director General herself, um, Jamie Oliver, um, whom you I assume that you're all familiar with um, the Finnish Minister of Family Affairs and Social Services, and then also the former Prime Minister of Namibia. The NCD Lines and the World Cancer Research Fund International will be launching um, a new advocacy brief on ambitious, smart commitments to address NCDs, overweight, and obesity. At this um, event, um, the brief will unpack the framework for action of the Second International Conference on Nutrition by illustrating how the recommendations of this framework or in this framework for action can be translated into concrete, ambitious policy commitments um, for NCDs, overweight, and obesity. Um, where possible, the, the brief will also point to so-called double duty actions. Um, these double duty actions are um, actions that hold the potential to impact both undernutrition and overweight and obesity and NCDs at the same time, as opposed to addressing specific types of malnutrition in isolation. And we very much um, encourage the, the need to prioritize such double duty actions in the global response to malnutrition, to address malnutrition in all its forms. Next slide, please. I've included on um, this slide and the next slide an overview of NCD-related side event career. Could you just move on to the next slide already? Um, I will let you explore these side events um, by your own in follow-up to, to this webinar um, to save some time for the upcoming presentations. You will see on this slide I've also included a link to a full calendar of uh, side events that we've put together and that goes beyond what is shown on these two slides. And if you um, are aware of any side events that we haven't included on, on our calendar, please reach out um, to Infight and to Alliance to, to share these events. Next slide, please. Finally, to wrap up um, my presentation, um, I just want to sum up our advocacy messages for this year's WHA. Um, 
first one really is to emphasize the insufficient progress in the nine go one C targets um, to date. Re member states really must hear this message come from the NCD community loud and clearly. Um, second point really is around the preparations for the 2018 UN high level review, which really starts this year, uh, emphasizing the need to fast track implementation of the four time bound commitments, prioritize strengthening of monitoring and surveillance system, um, include a note um, on the WHO GCM NCD working group reports at the, in the WHA resolution on NCDs, and then as always really urging governments to involve society um, every step of the way in this, this process to prepare for the UN high level review in 2018. In particular, the involvement of NCD alliances and NCD civil society at the national level. Third, um, a top level message is around, the, around mobilizing sustainable resources for NCDs and improving tracking of resources, highlighting the need to strengthen domestic financing, including via taxation of unhealthy products, integrate NCDs into multilateral and bilateral development assistance, and um, develop a purpose code for NCDs in the OECD creditor reporting system. Finally, we urge member states to take bold action to, to overweight and to obesity by endorsing the new WHO guidance on inappropriate marketing of infant foods, and then also um, uh, highlighting the importance of the development of a robust plan of action and accountability framework to implement the comprehensive set of recommendations of the WHO Commission on Ending Childhood Obesity. Finally, um, you will find at the bottom of the slide a link to a comprehensive advocacy briefing that we've made available on our website. Um, and um, please feel free to reach out to us with any intelligence that you're hearing on any of these, these agenda items or any information that you, will, you wish to be sharing with us. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Elena, for walking us through such a complex set of um, issues. Um, so for those of you who are heading to the World Health Assembly in a couple of weeks, really encourage you all to, to take a look at the, the link for the, for the papers, for the timetable for the World Health Assembly, and then also to the, obviously the NCD Alliance's advocacy briefing, which really does provide quite a, a good background on a lot of these um, issues. Um, also, I should have mentioned at the beginning that um, we will be sending around the PowerPoint slides as we always do at the end of the webinar, and also there will be a recording of the webinar available for anyone to, who wants to listen, uh, who hasn't managed to, to join um, now, or if you want to listen again. Elena, just one quick question, because um, I realize that we, we're, we're tight on time today. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the, the main NCD agenda. So you're obviously outlining a lot of the different elements of the paper, which is, which is fairly long. There's a lot of different elements within that paper. And then obviously the member states are going to be um, endorsing two processes, one on an update on Appendix 3 of the Global Action Plan, and the second on an approach to, to register and publish contributions of non-state actors. Both sound extremely process heavy. Um, could you just say a little bit more about why the update of Appendix 3 is, is so important for, for us? Um, yes, sure. So um, for all of those that are not familiar with Appendix 3 of the Global Entity Action Plan, this is a, a list of, of interventions that are have been identified to be very cost effective or cost effective. And this is a sort of menu of policy options that member states can or should be prioritizing um, uh, in, their, in their national response. Um, and when the Global Action Plan was adopted in 2013, um, there was a provision to to update um, the appendix three to to look at whether the um, the uh, interventions included in the current appendix three are are um, are up to date, um, and so there will be um, a process um, that actually started last year already to to be um, to analyze um, whether whether the, the the interventions that are included are still up to date and and there will be um, an opportunity for for civil society to to input into this this um, process we were told that this may take place in June but um, this still remains to be confirmed and we'll 
make sure to, to inform your VRE alerts um, on this matter. Finally, the, the second point is on a registry um, of commitments by non-state actors that the Secretariat has been asked to develop in 2016 for adoption um, in 2017 at the World Health Assembly. And this, this um, registry um, would publish contributions made by the private sector, by philanthropic entities, and by civil society toward the achievement of the global NCD targets. Um, there's also um, multi-stakeholder consultations um, that will take place throughout the year. No time and no dates have been announced yet, um, but this will be quite quite an important um, activity um, under the, the umbrella of the global coordination mechanism to um, to look at what what non-state actors are contributing to the NCD response. From our perspective, it's very important that this work be based on rigorous indicators and regular reporting um, of commitments and that, that the data that is included um, in this registry is, is comparable. Um, yeah, thank you. Fantastic, thanks. And just a couple of other announcements from, from my side related to the World Health Assembly. Um, so the NCD Alliance will be launching two um, reports at WHA this year. One of them will be on workplace and NCDs that we have been developing together with our partner Bupa, and it's specifically on the role of public policy um, played in workplace and NCDs. Um, and the second one is our annual report for 2015, so to look out for, for both of them during WHA. And then just finally, we're, we're also holding a, an NGO pre-briefing um, ahead of the World Health Assembly on the Sunday um, at 4 till 6 p.m. for NGOs only. Um, but if you haven't received an invitation and would like to attend, please do um, email us at info at ncdalliance.org and um, we'll, we'll send you over an invitation. Thanks very much, Elena, for that, for that fantastic presentation. Now let's move on to the second part of our webinar, um, which is focused on the WHO Global Coordination Mechanism. So let me hand over to Dr. Bento Mickelson, who's the Head of the Secretariat of the WHO Global Coordination Mechanism for NCD. Bento. So uh, good afternoon, good morning, and thank you very much for giving me the floor. Um, I mean, the time is short, so I will jump a lot of the, the slides that you will see here and everything will be published afterwards. So I will concentrate really on the topic and I am of course extremely happy that Rachel Nugent and Sir Trevor Hassel is going to be a little bit more in depth of the work of the working groups from the global coordinating mechanism. So if we move quickly to uh, just move on and uh, move on just Thank you. Yeah, this slide is important because we find that it is very important to stress that uh, coming to uh, results in 2018 is really the step towards uh, achieving the targets of the SDG and the NCD related targets. We know that there has been some discussion if we need a complete reorientation we find that many of the components that is already in the UN General Assembly political declaration and so on is definitely sort of uh, part of the goals and the targets of the SDGs. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. So I then just will brief you very quickly on things that are going on in the global coordinating mechanism. And uh, uh, we are at the moment planning for the next dialogue. Uh, it will be hosted by a country in Afro, and it will happen in October. And it will be a sort of a continuation of the working group that uh, uh, looked into recommendations for engagement with the private sector. This time it will be a little bit broader, so it's actually engagement with the non-state actors. Uh, I must say it's a lot of interest already, and we will call for interest. We are very eager to see um, country cases uh, that can showcase that this is possible, this is necessary, that we all join forces to be able to engage for NCD. We are also on the planning a uh, global com communication campaign, and we plan to launch it uh, in New York, 18th of July. 
and we have already had uh, several discussions with the NCD Alliance and other stakeholders, and we will open up for a discussion so this can really be seen as something that will help us to reach the targets in 2018 and then 2030. We are setting up uh, uh, several communities of uh, practice and, uh, and uh, are uh, experimenting with different ways of disseminating knowledge. I will move from this to uh, just frame the two working groups that will be more commented in the next two uh, interventions. So please move to the next slide. And I brought this rather dull, perhaps, uh, slide because especially from the NGO sector, it has been several questions on how to become a member of the working group and how to uh, sort of influence on the work. Is there any possibility at all? So I would very much like to answer all of these questions. So please just send us uh, questions around this or go to our um, web uh, pages. And for those of uh, you, probably most of you, you will know that it is 12 uh, members in each of the working group. They are nominated uh, or they are appointed by the DG from a roster nominated by the member states. And uh, we have been as uh, clear as we can that we really need uh, representatives or uh, experts from all kind of sectors and also from all kind of stakeholders. I think so far we can say that the, the, the level of expertise and experience has been very good in the two working groups that delivered their work to the DG this year. And we are also very happy to see that uh, the experts for the new working groups is uh, uh, really sort of uh, um, uh, providing a lot of expertise. Of course, uh, we see that we need to engage more. So both of these uh, working groups will, as last year, have hearings with different stakeholders, and we will work together with our partners to see how can we sort of reflect uh, um, the different views. We will also try to, um, or we plan to have a two interims report from the new working groups this year, which will go on the web for consultation, as we did last year quite successfully. So this is about the process and the structure. If you move to the next slide, please. And the next slide, please. So we try to just be very brief on the recommendations. And Rachel will probably uh, be more uh, sort of comprehensive of this when it comes to financing and so Trevor about the private sector. But we are quite pleased with a sort of a mixture of quite high level recommendations that doesn't duplicate but build on um, uh, decisions made in the governing bodies. And below each of these recommendations, there are also uh, specific action points. So uh, we are very happy that the NCD Alliance uh, um, pinpointed the need to, to note and to, to make these uh, reports uh, known to the World Health Assembly and beyond. And uh, they are now on the web. Uh, they will be also sent by the DG to stakeholders and member states. And we will use uh, these reports as input to, to the new work in the two new working groups this year and build on the experience that we have from these working groups and also uh, follow up in countries through the UN Interagency Task Force and other mechanisms to be sure that these are known, hopefully useful, and uh, hopefully also implemented. Next slide, please. So these are the three new working groups. And that's my, I think, the last slide I will show you. Um, and you probably already know, and you can go to our web page, and you will see these uh, mandates, and also who is in the working group, what kind of background document do we have already published, and so on. But as you can see, this is highly relevant topics. So the first working group is working on inclusion of the prevention and control of MCV to HIV AIDS, and uh, also programs for sexual and reproductive health and maternal and child health. As well, as well as communicable diseases, and also, very important, into primary health care and, uh, and universal health coverage. Uh, the working group is co-chaired by Japan and uh, Colombia. 
The other working group is on international cooperation on NCV with national plans in order to strengthen aid efficiency and develop impact of external resources in support of NCVs. And it's really about sort of how to match the demand from the country with international cooperation. And it uh, leans on very much of the work that was done by the financing group and the policy briefs, as many of you know, from Rachel Nugent last year. And uh, the, the topic will be very much about how can we strengthen the demand side, how can we really attract the, the donors, bilateral, multilateral, is there frameworks in place that can be used. And we have a huge request on business cases and also on investment framework, which was also the outcome of the work from uh, last year. The third uh, working group is on health education and health literacy for NCDs. And we will start up this working group as a community of practice, and it will be formally established in 2017 and are co-chaired by a co-chair from um, Russia and also from uh, China. And I didn't mention the second working group. Uh, it is co-chaired by uh, uh, Norway and Zimbabwe. So I think that's uh, enough from my side to give space to other speakers. Thank you so much, Katie. Thanks very much, Ben, for that, for that presentation. Just one quick question that has come through the, the chat facility for you. Um, how can country-level NGOs that aren't in official relations with WHO engage in the work of the GCM? So we really welcome every organization that uh, will consider to become a participant of the GCM. And it's, uh, we think it's rather easy. You can go to our web page and you can find the, the how to become a participant. And we will be as quick as we can to really uh, see if you are eligible. Um, so this is the way forward, and we will publish more about that in the coming months because we really want to boost the participant list. We need all people on board, and uh, this is very helpful for the communication campaign, for the, for the country cases, and all the work of the GCM. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bente. Now we move on to our third presenter, um, which is Dr. Rachel Nugent, who is the Vice President of Global NCD at RTI International, to present on the GCM Working Group Report on Financing for NCDs. Over to you, Rachel. Thanks very much, Katie, and, and thanks everyone, and especially to Bente for teeing up this topic. So um, I will try to be relatively brief. I had the privilege of working with the working group uh, on this topic, the working group that took place last year, number 5.1, and the report is now out and available on the website. So I'm going to give you a, a fairly quick overview. Um, and I'm not going to uh, even speak too much to the slides because you can read slides and you'll have them later. I'll give you a little bit more of my sort of um, personal impressions about the process and, and how I observed the discussion and, and what I think are sort of the key takeaways and, and the value that this working group has provided. But you can see here on this slide the members of the working group. There were two very committed co-chairs, Dr. Indrani Gupta and uh, Mr. Colin McKiff. Um, very committed, I think importantly, because it was a quite diverse working group of people who had a really wide range of knowledge about the issue of financing in general and NCD financing specifically. And I think that was very good. It was a challenge for the co-chairs, a challenge for the working group as a whole because of trying to get everybody on the same page, which took some time I, I would say, but a very important because I think it exposed to us um, the different perspectives that people bring to these issues of financing. Um, move on, please. Next slide. Uh, so here are the five recommendations. Uh, you've uh, seen them in Bente's slide. You can look at them later. I won't dwell on them a lot, but I would say in general the recommendations are, they look pretty simple. Um, probably there's nothing surprising here. Uh, the first one, yes, again, a call to mobilize additional resources. I think that that, um, in, in fact, it was a, a bit of a discussion in and of itself in the working group about uh, whether the working group should make that call uh, first and foremost. But uh, in, in the end, I think everyone was very much on that page that there does need to be additional resources and that the working group needed to make a very strong statement about that. 
Then recommendation two focuses on the domestic resource mobilization, and recommendation three on the official development assistance uh, ex and external resources. And again, there was some debate about this. Um, you'll see that the domestic resource mobilization comes first, and it was very much, I would say, the dominant view in the working group that um, that official development assistance uh, and, and external resources are not going to be, uh, should not be relied upon too heavily, should not be expected to be um, forthcoming in, in big quantities, that in fact this was the responsibility of countries. There was some divergence of view on that, but I would say from my perspective that that, that was a dominant view in the working group. And so as a result you see uh, the domestic resources being being put as part of uh, as a, a recommendation ahead of the ODA recommendation, but both of them are there in the working group. In the end, agreed that both are are quite important in different contexts. Um, recommendation four: There was not a lot of debate about the private sector role. I think everyone took on that the private sector is important uh, as a as a not just a source of financing. I'm saying source of financing. Yes, that was that was there, but as a partner and also important to recognize the diversity of the private sector. Um, and, and I think that was uh, quite well recognized. And then finally, policy coherence. So those are the recommendations. Um, I think they do look rather simple. They're the high level things. They weren't necessarily simple to arrive at, but they, they do look rather simple. Let's move on. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about this. I, I will say that uh, it reflects the fact that the approach of the working group was broad to the issue of financing. It wasn't at all focused just on official development assistance, obviously, as I mentioned, and it wasn't just um, focused on raising tobacco taxes, although there was a lot of discussion on that. Um, but in fact, I think a recognition that, look, we're in a, uh, a world where we have to be looking at a lot of different kinds of financing, so we need to understand different instruments. And this, um, this chart, though it's a little bit complicated, mainly is intended to get across the idea that uh, we need to both generate new resources, that's the part on the left, the green box on the left, and that can be from public funds, from private funds, and from global funds. And there's some examples, not, not a comprehensive list, but some examples. And then on the right, and this was, I think, a bit of a surprise to me, there was a lot of discussion over the course of the three working group meetings on managing what, what is called here, managing existing resources. Essentially, you know what, you know, it's not all about raising new money, it's also about using the money more efficiently. That was a surprise to me because that got us into some discussions about how money gets spent and how to be efficient in spending that money. And yes, that's very relevant to financing, but I think there was a little bit of a struggle to not get sucked into a long discussion about efficiency of spending, which some working group members would have been happy to, to engage in, but instead to try to stay on the topic of financing and how to use financing instruments and financing language to improve efficiency of resource use. So there's some examples there about how to do that. Uh, move on, please. Next slide. Uh, so here I will say that I think the best parts of the report are the practical parts of the report. Uh, the report starts out with an overview. I don't think that there will be much new in there for most of you on the phone. I think it provides justification and arguments and some facts that are useful to all of us, but no, no real new ground there. Then the recommendations I already mentioned. Then a discussion about the enabling environment, which has a lot to do with the uh, policy alignments and so on. And then I think um, one of the most practical parts of the report is part two, which uh, this is reflective of. It provides a stepwise process, if you will, uh, for countries to engage in to assess their, uh, their burden, their needs, their capacity, and their resource opportunities, and then come up with a plan about financing uh, NCDs in relation to all of those things. So the arrows go in different directions on this slide. It doesn't really have to happen in, in any particular order. Those steps can happen simultaneously, in fact. And part two, um, along with some of the appendices at the end, lay out um, how countries can do that. It really is sort of a toolkit. Now, it's a toolkit that, that needs to happen with some relatively good technical assistance or relatively strong capacity on the financing and, and economic and budgeting side. But that's, that's what countries um, 
will need to work on and, and the GCM and, and others will engage with the countries on doing that. Next slide, please. Um, here again, I think this is just a, it's a, it's a practical look in a way at different scenarios. It's just a few examples that are laid out here to indicate that you know, there are a lot of uh, different situations. Each country is different in fact, but there are different situations with respect to the disease burden, the health system, the macro and, and fiscal situations that I was just talking about. And so when countries do their assessment, they'll come up with their, their picture, their mapping of their situation and their needs, and then they will have different policy options and different financial options available to them. And again, the steps and then several of the appendices at the end that, that demonstrate the use of a few of the tools that are talked about, for instance, the One Health tool, the National Health Account, different kinds of financial instruments, and how they can get done, that those things are going to look different for different countries. And one of the other parts of the report that I like very much is Appendix 3 that provides examples um, of all different kinds from countries of ways of financing NCDs, mostly NCDs, but not all examples from NCDs. But again, it's a way this, this little table and then Appendix 3 um, are meant as ways to show countries that there are a lot of options and they have to find themselves um, in, in this set of um, assessments and decisions to be made. There's no sort of one-stop shopping or one-size-fits-all. Next slide, please. So lastly, there are next steps that are laid out. I'll just go to the sort of bottom part of this slide and, and say, um, you know, sharing information. All, a lot of countries are going through the same questions about financing, the same challenges. And so sharing information, the report does a lot of that with the examples that it offers and it encourages more of that um, using the GCM and the other ways of, of cooperating on these issues, getting some technical assistance where needed to use the tools. Um, investment frameworks are something, um, investment cases are something that countries are very much uh, asking for and, and WHO and, and others are trying to help provide that and that will tell uh, leadership of countries, here's what you can invest, here's what you'll get for it and using country level data. So a lot of that work will be forthcoming over the next couple of years I would say. And then of course advocacy, trying to establish a community of practice in this area and additional knowledge sharing. So I'll stop with that and I'm happy to take questions. Excellent. Thanks very much Rachel for that, for that great presentation. So as this, this report is obviously a really important one, as both of them are obviously, but the, the financing piece and the NCD response has always really been the, the Achilles heel really. Um, so it's great to have more evidence and arguments and, and advocacy around around this issue. Um, there haven't been any questions yet that have come in, but I but I have one myself for you, Rachel, if that's okay. Um, great. Obviously, on the, the phone today we have um, you know a significant number of civil society organisations all very keen to obviously increase the, the amount of resources going to, to NCDs in their country. How do you think the NCD Alliance members at the country level can support implementation of these recommendations? Yes, yeah, great question, Katie. I think the NCD Alliances in country are critical to this, not just because of their advocacy role, which is you know front and center, and they are the ones to be advocating, but I think also in helping um, country ministries and and the technical people, you know, economists like myself and others, um, to identify, you know, to do those assessments that I talked about, particularly on the needs side and the capacity side, because not all capacity resides within the public sector, and and the public sector, the governments, you know, should have a pretty good handle. They'll need to to walk through some steps, but they should have a pretty good handle on what um, the capacity is that they are offering, but the civil society provides capacity too, knows about other capacity, knows better probably, you know, when people go to facilities, where do they go and why, when they don't, why not, um, how to uh, be able to bring the services closer to people in the way that they'll use it. So I think civil society is a very important intermediary in these assessments that I mentioned, as well as in uh, responding to what comes out of them and helping governments then decide what the priorities are. I'll stop. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. 
And, and one other question that's come in on the chat facility. So on the country scenario um, for low-income countries, was there a discussion about feasibility to implement a tax scheme on tobacco or any other un uh, unhealthy products um, to raise adequate funding? So basically, were there concerns that even if they want to use this as a way to raise resources, it may not raise enough funding? There was a lot of discussion about um, feasibility to raise tobacco taxes. Um, I think my own personal perspective is that the members of the working group were perhaps over optimistic about uh, tobacco taxes being a solution. It's not a panacea. We all know that. It is an important tool among other tools. And so there was some discussion about that. We didn't get deep into the weeds about particular um, tools for particular countries. The table I showed is sort of a, a very generic example of a few different scenarios. And, and um, I think you know people on the line as well as others, I just came from a CDC meeting of economists, most of whom work on tobacco taxes. So there's a lot of information out about the design of tobacco taxes in different contexts and what we know about, um, about um, tax evasion, what we know about smuggling, what we know about lots of the aspects of tobacco taxation. So I think again, what we're pushing or what, what the, the working group report is, is making possible and what I think we're promoting to countries is go through these steps, assess your situation, keeping in mind the broad range of tools available because you will come up with different answers than a country, another country that is elsewhere with different situations. And so it, it does have to be pretty much customized. Um, and tobacco taxes will work in some places and they won't work in others. Well, they should work in all places. I guess I'm off. I'm off message, aren't I? But <laughs> but they will be different, and they will need to be designed differently in different places. Mm -hmm. And just one final question. So, so looking ahead to the next UN high level review on NCDs, which is taking place in 2018, did, did the working group and the report consider the need for a political target around financing for NCDs? I, you know, Benji may correct me. I don't recall discussion of a target in the working group. My recollection is that there was so much debate about um, the balance between domestic financing and what domestic uh, revenues should provide, and the official development assistance or external financing. Uh, that I wouldn't. I don't think that the working group even wanted to approach the idea of setting a target again. So they may have a different recollection, but um, it didn't happen in that group that I recall. It's been there. No, it didn't. So, um, but I think what was part of the discussion was trying to be more sort of accurate in a way because there was made uh, huge points that if you move to other programmatic areas, they had figures. I mean, they know exactly what they need. In NCD, it tends to be different. So there was quite a bit of a discussion of sort of commitment to investment level at the national level, so, but not as a global or a regional target. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Rachel, and to Bento there for, for that presentation as well on the, the financing report. Just in the interest of time, we're going to have to, to move on. But, but thanks again, Rachel, for that presentation. And, for those who haven't seen the, the report, um, we've provided the link in the chat facility for you to, to link into the financing report and they're available on the, the GCM website as well. So now let me hand over to our um, third speaker, Sir Trevor Hassel, who is the, the president of the Healthy Caribbean Coalition and also uh, the chair of the Barbados National NCD Commission to talk us through the second GCM report which is focused on engagement with the private sector. Sir Trevor. Okay, so thanks very much, Katie. And um, Bente has given a, a very nice introduction uh, to uh, this presentation. The next slide. And, uh, and so this slide just simply outlines uh, the members of this working group uh, 3.1 with the co-chairs from, uh, from developed and developing countries and a very rich a uh, wide and varied group of five members from each region of the WHO. Next slide. On this slide, it's, it's very clearly stated, and I think it's important to appreciate 
uh, that the remit of this working group was essentially to respond uh, to very to five very specific areas as in terms of recommending how uh, governments uh, should relate to the uh, private sector to strengthen their contribution to NCD prevention and control. And so these five specific areas were uh, producing and promoting more food products consistent with a healthy diet, reducing the use of salt in the food industry, reducing the impact of the marketing of unhealthy food and non-alcohol beverages to children, promoting and creating an enabling environment for healthy behaviors among workers, and improving access to affordable NCD medicines and technologies. And so these were the very five specific areas uh, that we focused on. Uh, the next slide. Uh, essentially, uh, the report then, which uh, was recently finalized and has been tabled uh, for the World Health Assembly meeting later this month, it consists of an introduction and a background, a summary of key findings in which an indication of components of best practice engagement between governments and the private sector is included, followed by overarching recommendations and then recommendations in the five specific target areas that I, that I mentioned. Uh, the document then concludes with what I would like to think is of highly informative and very useful annexes. Next slide. Sorry, if we could just go back. Sorry, just go back one sec. So what, thank you. So what were, first of all, some of the key findings? First of all, an urgent need to scale up the contribution of the diverse range of private sector entities. Also, a recognition uh, that the role and contribution of different private sector entities. Also, the need to be much more discerning when considering these varying roles. And then a further key findings had to do with issues related to public safeguarding public health interests and managing conflict of interest. The next slide. The next slide. Uh, further key findings uh, which were discussed, if you will, in the context of uh, building blocks for best practice related to strong regulatory frameworks. And this features very significantly in this, in this uh, report. Uh, as does the fact of the need for a multi-stakeholder platform for implementation with a robust mechanism to review and ensure effective commitments and contribution, and the use of measures including incentives to encourage a strong private sector contribution. Again, the emphasis was on transparent management of conflict of interest and sharing of knowledge. Next slide. So what were some of the overarching recommendations? And there were six of these, which again stressed the need of a strong national statutory and regulatory framework in uh, related to the private sector uh, in the prevention and control of NCDs. Uh, detailed comments on the need to establish a multi-stakeholder platform for engagement. Uh, the need for a robust mechanism uh, to review and ensure effective delivery of the commitments and contributions. The next set of the next slide. And also, it was recommended that governments should better align their private sector incentives with national public health goals to encourage and facilitate a stronger contribution to the NCD prevention and control effort. And finally, the last two bullets of overarching recommendations, again, spoke to transparency uh, and conflict of interest issues. Uh, these overarching recommendations were uh, supported by actions and evidence to justify or support the recommendations. Next slide. Uh, the next series of slides speaks to uh, recommendations with regard to the specific 
um, um, the specific issues, firstly the marketing to children. And here, a uh, strong emphasis was placed on the need for a strong regulatory framework to underpin the engagement with the wide range of relevant private sector entities. Uh, so this was a, 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 a very important overarching uh, issue as it related to the market of children. The next slide. With respect to the issue of the promotion of more food products consistent with a health diet, uh, including the reduction of the use of salt to lower consumption, um, the two main uh, recommendations here were that governments should elicit clear time-bound commitments. And also that, again, governments should work with the relevant stakeholders. So there was, as I think you will notice emerging, um, certain principles. Firstly, that there's a, a need for leadership and responsibility on the part of government to protect the health uh, of, it, of its people. Secondly, uh, to have regulation uh, in place if necessary. But thirdly, to also work with the private sector in as constructive and positive a way as possible. The next slide. This spoke to the uh, specific uh, recommendations related to the promotion and creation of an enabling environment for healthy behaviors among workers. And the uh, recommendations here were that governments should engage again with a diverse range of private sector entities. And that uh, expression uh, tracks throughout the document, making the point or re-emphasizing the point that the private sector is not homogeneous, but it is very much a, a heterogeneous uh, entity. And the second point here was that government should once again emphasize a strong regulatory framework to achieve greater coherence within the workplace. And of course, there was, uh, during the three meetings, uh, had lots of discussion uh, highlighting the fact that the workplace provided an excellent opportunity for the private sector to contribute significantly to the prevention and control of NCDs. The next slide. Uh, the final uh, uh, category, if you will, of specific uh, in which specific recommendations were advanced uh, were in relation to improving the access to and the affordability of medicines and technologies. And here it was clearly pointed out and has been repo and reported in that government should recognize uh, that the private sector are important stakeholders and also the government should actively explore opportunities through public private partnerships to increase access to safe, effective, affordable, and quality assured essential NCD medicines. The next slide. I've included this slide because I thought it was uh, of particular importance to this webinar uh, because though the uh, report uh, related to the private sector, uh, there was a section, albeit a limited section, uh, that spoke to engagement, government's engagement beyond the private sector. Uh, one of the important points I thought that was made was that civil society uh, had, uh, and NGOs in general, had a significant potential role to play in the enhancing the relationship between government on the one hand and the private sector in the prevention and control of NCDs. Um, this slide um, just gives an outline of some of the ways in which that can be, the, in which civil society can contribute, such as influencing individual behavior, uh, representing public health and consumer interests, increasing public knowledge and awareness, uh, and so on. And I think this is, a, for us, in civil society, an important part of the, of the, of the report 
and one that perhaps the NCB alliance might look to engage with, with, its, with its NGO constituents to see how uh, they might deliver uh, specifically in this area. The next slide, please. Finally, there is a very rich uh, set of um, topics discussed in the annexes, uh, as I've outlined on, on this slide, uh, but I've just highlighted the fact that one of the important issues here uh, in the annexes relates to bottlenecks and challenges to, to faster progress. And so with that um, very brief high-level overview of the of the report on engagement with the private sector, I just would like to conclude by making the point that, in my judgment, the document is an excellent one. The challenge going forward now is to uh, discuss and consider ways in which we might make this document a living, breathing, and effective working document uh, with governments uh, throughout the world, for I think it has much to offer in the area of engagement of governments uh, with the private sector uh, in this endeavor. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sir Trevor, for that, for that excellent presentation. Um, again, that for everybody on the line, the, the link for that report has just been posted on the chat facility for you to be able to access it. One quick question for you, Sir Trevor, if that's okay. Um, we've had a question through from Paula Johns in Brazil. Um, did the working group discuss how governments and civil society should require accountability when private sector funded associations fight against regulatory measures, for example, in the areas of labeling or marketing restrictions to children? Yes, well, I think this is, this is clearly a very uh, challenging uh, issue, and I think it is one that we've got to continue to have a conversation. Um, I, I know that there are different views um, that are held with regard to the engagement of the private sector uh, in the uh, efforts to prevent and control NCBs. My personal view is that we do need to engage with the private, private sector but even as we do so, we need to address the challenges. And the, the question that has been posed um, represents a particularly difficult challenge. Um, but even as I say that, I think it is important that we share our recognition of the fact that this is a challenge and then seek to Use, use our, our many different experiences and expertise to address the challenge. Great. Thank you very much, Sir Trevor. And I completely agree with you that now all of our challenge is basically to try and bring these reports to life. Um, and as civil society organizations, we have a, a major role in supporting the implementation of the recommendations. So thank, thank you for that presentation. Now we move on to our next agenda item. So after those presentations on the global coordination mechanism, we return back to the World Health Assembly. Um, and we're going to do a deeper dive into the nutrition-related agenda items at the WHA. Um, and I'll hand over to Dr. Francesco Branca, who is the Director of Nutrition for Health and Development at WHO, to talk us through these. Francesco. Francesco, are you, are you there? Okay, Francesco doesn't seem to be on the line right now. So why don't we flip forward to Priya's presentation on um, the New York side of um, advocacy, so to talk us through the 2030 Agenda follow-up and review and the Financing for Development follow-up, and hopefully we'll get Francesco on the line um, during this presentation. Over to you, Priya. Great. Thanks very much, Katie. Uh, so I will just very briefly go over um, some of the process to establish a follow-up and review framework for the 2030 Agenda. Um, 
and it looks sorry, Katie, it looks like Francesco is online and but I think his sound is muted, so note to ready talk to please dial in Francesco. Um, so as quick background to this process, the 2030 Agenda, which was adopted in September, as we know, recognized that follow-up and review is a very critical component of successful implementation of the goals and targets. And uh, the Agenda established that the high-level political forum under ECOSOC would be the platform for this review. And the first HLPF after the adoption of the SDGs will be in New York from the 18th to the 20th of July. And so two co-facilitators, the ambassadors of Belize, Belize and Denmark, uh, were appointed to hold consultations with member states to develop a framework for review. Uh, this is just a quick uh, schematic on the road to framework for follow-up and review. And as you can see, this began in January and has been ongoing uh, through now. So January saw the publication of the UN Secretary General's report on the components of a global follow-up and review framework. Uh, and this was really to inform discussions and, and get member states thinking about what an essential components of follow-up and review for, this agen for the agenda would be. In April, the co-facilitators held an informal meeting with member states to get their reactions to the Secretary General's report and see some of their reactions and ideas for what a framework would entail. Uh, a few days after that, they produced an elements paper with, uh, which really summarized what the member states had said about what they would like to see in a framework. They then held um, another informal meeting on the 28th of April to discuss this elements paper and make further revisions, followed by an expert level meeting on, to discuss themes for the high level political forum as one of the ideas from the Secretary General was to uh, structure the high-level political forum around a cluster of themes that would cover all three dimensions of sustainable development. Uh, on the 6th of May, so just last Friday, uh, they released a zero draft of the resolution, um, and, um, which will then be discussed actually tomorrow afternoon on the 12th of May. And the co-facilitators expect that by the end of May, they will be adopting this resolution, which I'll go into very shortly after this, um, which will then put into place this framework for the HLPF, which will be held in July. So some key components of the zero draft was the co-facilitators, based on what member states uh, inputted, was that Goal 17 on means of implementation will be reviewed annually, and there will be a cluster of all of the other goals into three groups. Um, those you can see below, uh, 2017, 18, and 19 each has an overarching theme under which the goals fit under that. Uh, so goal 3 on health under which the NCD target, target 3.4, would potentially be reviewed under 2019. And again, this is not agreed yet and is of course subject to revision based on consultations moving forward. Um, and additionally, there is a strong emphasis on the voluntary nature of reviews, but all countries are encouraged to carry out at least two reviews by 2030. Um, and also the, the zero draft includes that major groups and other stakeholders must be critical components of this process in line with existing resolutions, but it's rather unclear at this point how contributions from um, civil society and other stakeholders will be included in the process. Um, there is strong support for a web based platform and other innovative arrangements to enable diverse regional um, involvement and also civil society involvement. And this platform would really provide an opportunity for civil society to engage as well and serve as a resource um, deposit. Uh, so that's just a quick, very quick overview. Um, and I will pass it back to Katie and hopefully we can get Francesco on. Thanks very much, Priya. Um, there are no questions at the moment for, for that agenda item. Francesco, are you are you on the line now? No, we don't seem to we don't seem to be able to hear you. Okay, but we'll wait a couple more minutes. In the meantime, I'll ask you a couple of questions, Priya. Um, so obviously, the, the high level political forum is going to be the the review platform for the sustainable development goals, and obviously now NCDs are included in there. But obviously with this new kind of thematic approach of you know different themes being discussed at different years at the high level political forum, um, how will that play out? Because obviously you've mentioned that 2019 will be the year when empowering people will be discussed and under that the health goal will be discussed. 
Does that mean that you know, we've got to wait until 2019 to be talking about NCDs at the high level political forum or are there other ways of, of kind of maintaining the momentum? Right. Um, thanks, Katie. I think there are definitely ways to maintain the momentum. And I think the clustering of the goals is done in such a way that, you know, it speaks to all three dimensions of sustainable development. And since the, the goals and targets are very much integrated, there are opportunities to discuss NCDs. For example, if we're discussing um, the, the targets on nutrition and the goals on nutrition or education or, or water and sanitation, urban planning, etc., those are all very much directly related to the risk factors um, and causes of many of the NCDs. So just because the goal specifically is on um, uh, up for discussion under in 2019 doesn't mean that we have to wait until 2019 to discuss NCDs. I think um, that the co-facilitators and member states are, were very uh, careful to say that you know the integrated nature makes it such that all issues could be discussed during each of the reviews. Mm -hmm. Great. And how, and you mentioned the kind of voluntary reporting of governments to the high-level political forum. How, how would that actually work? I'm sorry, one more time, Katie. The, the, voluntary, the voluntary reporting yeah. of um, member states to the high-level political forum. Sure. So for what we've seen um, this time is that about 20 member states have volunteered to conduct the initial voluntary reviews at the HLPS. And the idea is that um, the member states will come forward themselves. I don't know if there's been any, any provision for member states who do not volunteer to present their reviews at the HLPS thus far, but I think that will be something that's brought up at the consultations tomorrow. And again, because it is voluntary and all members are encouraged to present, I don't know that we will necessarily see a checklist of sorts for each member state having um, conducted the review. Um, so I, d I think that's something that will further develop. Great, thanks. And just one final question. Um, so how important is it for, for the NTD community to be at the High Level Political Forum this year, so in, in July 2016? Uh, I, think, I think quite important uh, because it is the first time when we will see, uh, when we will see this uh, happening. And I think it will be a good opportunity for the NCD community to see what member states and other stakeholders also are, are speaking about and opportunities for us to engage um, engage with member states and to ensure that NCDs stay at the top of the level of their priorities. Great. Thanks very much, Priya. Um, Francesco, have you managed to, to join us one, one last time? I'm hoping that you're there. Mm, no. We seem to be having problems with, with the line. Um, so what I suggest is that we, we do a um, have a specific nutrition um, agenda item on our webinar after the World Health Assembly, so we'll be able to hear about all of the outcomes from WHA, and we'll invite Francesco to, to present on that. So I apologise um, for that for that technical issue. Um, so let's go to the the, the next slide. Um, this is just a, a quick look at. Um, can we move to the next slide? Yeah. So this is just a quick overview of of some of our. Um, NCD cafes and dialogues that we're organizing over the next um, couple of months. Uh, so these are cafes and dialogues that we're organizing at our federation's congresses, at the World Heart Federation Congress in Mexico, which is happening on the 4th to the 7th of June. We're or organizing an NCD cafe, so three days of specific NCD sessions at the WHF Congress. Uh, following that, in Liverpool on the 26th to 29th of October, we've got the Union's World Conference on Lung Health. And we're going to have two specific NCD dialogue sessions there. And then following that, on the 31st of October to the 3rd of November in Paris, we have the UICC World Cancer Congress, um, where we're organizing an NCD cafe, um, which again will be uh, three full days of NCD specific um, sessions. So really look out for the NCD cafes and dialogues if, um, if you're attending those conferences. Next slide, please. Um, and then finally, just to go into a bit more of a deep dive into the World Heart Federation Congress NCD Cafe. Uh, so you'll see we've got six sessions on different elements of NCDs, frontline health workers, sustainable financing, so to really pick up on uh, the report and presentation that um, Rachel made earlier. 
urban opportunities are looking at urban health and cardiovascular disease patients and leaving no one behind vulnerable populations. So that's the, that's the program that we've got for the World Heart Federation Congress, which we're very excited about. I understand that Francesco might have joined us. Francesco, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me now? Oh, fantastic. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> oh, Great. Brilliant. It was super frustrating to be here and not um, and, and shout and oh, really? uh, not be here. It's like on one of those nightmares. Okay. So, um, <laughs> good afternoon, good morning. Uh, so, you heard already from Elena that uh, we're going to have three documents uh, submitted uh, for the World Health Assembly. So the main one is um, WH679 on maternal infant and young child nutrition. We have two additions. One is a recommendation on ending inappropriate promotion of complementary food for which a resolution is expected. There's a drafting group. And the second document, a Addendum 2 um, on decade of action on nutrition for which other resolution or a decision uh, might, uh, might, take, uh, might occur. Um, on the first document, very quickly talks about the progress in achieving the global nutrition targets uh, and about the actions taken in the different areas uh, to implement uh, effective nutrition actions, to implement uh, actions intersectorally, to get uh, human and financial resources, to get monitoring in place, uh, and to get nutrition higher on the agenda. And we're seeing some progress uh, in terms of the targets uh, still Still, we see a lot of targets, a lot of countries that were actually off track and still you see the uh, burden of um, non-communicable diseases related to nutrition is, uh, is very high. Um, the report also um, briefs about uh, the implementation of the Code of Marketing Breast Milk Substitutes. The full uh, report was launched yesterday and you, you can see webinars on, on the WHO website. Uh, the important message is that, uh, first of all, we're getting more information from countries. Uh, it's uh, been 35 years since the code has been established. This is the first uh, uh, report we have uh, jointly with UNICEF and IBFAN, so we've put together all the energies to monitor the code, and we're getting more information from countries, so, so that's first good news. Uh, we are also having a bit more countries who have some provisions of the code in law. Um, but uh, in reality, those who have uh, all the legal measures in place are still a minority. Still about 39 countries only implement all the legal provisions of the code. And also very small numbers, uh, good monitoring and enforcement mechanisms in place. So that's a, that's a sign, a call to action. Uh, the second document is about uh, this guidance on ending inappropriate promotion of foods for infant and young ch children. This was requested uh, back in 2010. Uh, then there were intermediate steps to provide uh, definitions, clarifications on what uh, um, inappropriate uh, meant. But now, uh, after a series of meetings of a scientific and technical advisory group, uh, uh, there's the guidance that has been developed. The concerns are the interference on breastfeeding um, through uh, the use and promotion of uh, follow-on formulas and growing up milks, but also through the cross-promotion of um, um, through other complementary food products because uh, the um, products use the same brand and the same images um, for different age groups. Uh, there is also a concern about the risk of obesity and the fact that complementary foods are high in sugars, trans fat, and saturated fat. And, and uh, in reality, younger children do get uh, foods which are initially marketed for older children, but uh, we see more and more um, children having uh, really inadequate intake of um, of complementary food. So this is a set of uh, seven recommendations. The first one is um, uh, to refer to the um, guiding principle for complementary feeding of the breastfed child and guiding principle for uh, feeding non-breastfed children 6 24 months of age. A uh, second recommendation is to um, stop promotion of products that function as breast milk substitute, including follow-on formulas. Third recommendation is um, 
uh, about uh, the nutritional quality of the uh, of the products uh, that uh, should be the first uh, prerequisite to do any promotion. The fourth recommendation is uh, is sort of a do's and don'ts uh, about what messages could and could not be given. The fifth recommendation is to avoid cross promotion to promote breast milk substitutes uh, by the promotion of foods for infant and young children. Recommendation six is um, to avoid uh, conflict of interest by giving uh, gifts uh, to um, or interacting different ways uh, with health workers. And the final one is to implement the WHO set of recommendations on the marketing of food and non-alcoholic beverages to children. Um, the, the, this guidance is, um, as you can imagine, pretty um, controversial. So we're expecting a, a heated um, discussion over the resolution. The second uh, addendum document uh, is explaining that uh, uh, the General Assembly has proclaimed uh, the 26-2025 decade as the decade of action and nutrition to really implement uh, <clears throat> the recommended actions uh, included in the ICM-2 framework for action, but also to uh, indicate that uh, really nutrition is a cross-cutting agenda in the SDGs and you know, asking um, all actors to be active in the next 10 years around that SDG agenda of nutrition. Uh, the roadmap for the decade of action would be to have a launch uh, in July and then to start uh, asking countries to make their commitments around uh, the, the areas for the frame of correction. WHO and FAO will work on um, some example of, uh, of commitments, and hopefully we will have cycles uh, of uh, commitments every year, uh, so there will be a cycle of uh, uh, countries or other actors making commitments, and then uh, WHO and FAO um, handling uh, a database of commitments and preparing periodic reports. So, so the idea is to really request uh, that commitments are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. And uh, you know, this is an example here uh, on ad adoption uh, of a certain uh, an implementation of a certain legislation, for example, that on the International Code of Marketing Breast Milk Substitutes. Um, the reporting will be done, uh, um, first report will, will be done in May 2017 at the WHA, immediately followed by the same report submitted to the FAO Assembly, so the, this report will be done jointly, and, and then they will be also submitted to the General Assembly, and, and this cycle will be repeated every second year. The content of the reports will be the, a communication about the commitments made, uh, the progress of, on the policies and programs underway to implement those commitments, and then indicators for nutrition outcomes, nutrition policy environment, and uh, nutrition uh, um, program implementation, including uh, the, the indicators of the global nutrition monitoring uh, framework. Um, so, so these are the, the three documents. As I said, we expect to have uh, quite a lot of debate on the guidance on ending inappropriate uh, promotion of complementary food, and uh, hopefully there will be time for the countries to um, also discuss uh, um, their uh, to, to the views on the roadmap uh, for the decade of action. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Francesco. Um, Katie, our executive director, has just been cut off, and so I will um, have the pleasure of asking um, a couple of questions um, to you. So we understand that there is um, a fair amount of, of pushback on endorsement of the WHO guidance on ending inappropriate marketing of, of infant food. Um, how do you explain this, this um, resistance and do you think that um, it is likely for the guidance to be nonetheless endorsed at the WHA? The guidance uh, is a tool for countries, particularly low middle income countries, to develop uh, their own regulation and legislation. So there is a concern from um, countries that host uh, um, companies that produce uh, uh, particularly breast milk substitutes, uh, follow-on formulas, uh, that uh, you know, this might, might actually uh, constitute a trade uh, barrier. So that, that's a big concern. This is a, 
an industry of 70 billion uh, dollars a year uh, in a few years time uh, so we know that this is a concern another concern is uh, that uh, particularly in the EU there's been recently um, a set of regulations and, and the EU doesn't uh, feel comfortable of uh, um, endorsing a, a, a document which somehow might uh, might challenge those those regulations uh, but uh, you know we we think that there's a good debate there and um, the guidance is uh, going to be still a reference uh, that has been asked uh, to the secretariat so so normally um, countries have um, the freedom to uh, to reflect it uh, con in their legislation considering the, the local circumstances so so we we think that uh, the discussion on the resolution will uh, will introduce those uh, um, caveats and and still we we're we're confident that um, member states will uh, will allow this uh, public health tool to be available to all. Great. Um, so I guess for all of the advocates out there, um, it's a probably quite quite um, timely to to reach out to your governments in in support of. Of, of the guidance. And um, finally, one, one last question, um, Francesco. I understand that WHO and FAO are, are obviously um, compiling a, a compendium of, of smart um, commitments um, for governments. When do you expect this, this document to be available? Um, we have a, a very early draft. Uh, it's, uh, it's not an easy task, as you can imagine. We were hoping to have it available uh, for the launch in July, so we hope we'll be able to stick to that commitment. Great. Um, we'll certainly be looking forward to it. And, and just as I said before, um, the Institute Alliance and the World Cancer Research Fund International have, have also um, Prepare, uh, produced an, an advocacy brief that will be launched um, on, on the 23rd of May, so at the beginning of the WHA, um, that will also include um, a closer look at some of the recommendations contained in the ICN2 framework for action um, and, and uh, recommending specific commitments for entities overweight and, and obesity, as well as so-called double duty actions to address all forms of, of malnutrition, and, and that was also be a tool to governments and, and advocates um, to encourage smart commitments um, under the umbrella of the, the decade of action for nutrition. Um, I think on this note, I will end our webinar. Thanks um, to all of the, the presenters. Uh, thanks for, for everyone that has joined and, and stayed on the line. It was really um, a very exciting um, and, and packed agenda for for us all, um, please feel free to reach out to us in, in the lead up um, to the WHA. If you are a civil society organization, please join us for the civil society briefing um, on the 22nd of May. And, and finally, we'll um, have our next webinar in about six weeks of time, and we'll send around notifications then. Um, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the webinar call for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you may disconnect your line. Presenters, please stay on the line.